This week on the Computer Chronicles, software thinking tools. We'll show you a program called Go Figure that makes the computer think like you do rather than the other way around. We'll show you WinMap, a new visual way to deal with information and interpret complex data files. Trying to come up with a good new business strategy, your computer can help with a program called Project Kickstart. And we'll show you how your computer can help you make the tough decisions with two programs that will simplify the process of evaluating alternatives. All this plus Giles Online, this week's computer news, my pick of the week, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers, developing PCs for business. Additional funding provided by the Software Publishers Association, presenters of the CODES, the annual Excellence in Software Awards. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Well, they say computers are actually only fancy calculators. All they can really do is arithmetic. But if you can put complex human problems in mathematical form, Computers can do a lot more than just add, subtract, and multiply. Today, we're going to look at software thinking tools, computer programs that help you solve real human problems. Our first example is a new program called GoFigure from Villa Crespo Software. Dick, this is your baby. You developed GoFigure. Mm -hmm. Kind of what is it? It's sort of a, a spreadsheet in a way, isn't it? Well, it's also more of a paint program. You know, we looked at people and said, why can people use paint programs so easy and spreadsheets seem so difficult? This is like a large collection of mathematically smart clip art. So it's clip art that, that has smarts in it. Mm -hmm. All right, we've set up two little pieces of clip art, our windows so far, and let's explain what they are. I asked you to solve a housing problem for me. How much can I afford to buy? Mm -hmm. uh, income is 55000 I said, give me 25% of that monthly income to figure out what I can pay for a mortgage, and you calculated that. And I said, I'm looking at a house that's $220,000, and therefore, what would my mortgage be? Now, can we, can we create another piece of clip art and figure out what my monthly payments would be on that mortgage? Sure can. We're going to go into Go Figures Encyclopedia, uh, ask for the loan section, uh, go into Home Loans. In this case, we want mortgage payment. So you've got an encyclopedia of all these formulas already in the program. Thousands of the most frequently used formulas. Okay. And this is one for mortgage payment calculation. This will do a full amortization. So we're going to put it down, and we're going to tell it, first of all, that uh, we're going to be working here in dollars. Uh -huh. And now what we're going to do is we're going to ask to connect uh, this amount that we'd so like to sort of like cells in a spreadsheet. You can link these pieces of clip art, right? Correct. And now they're totally alive. A change anywhere affects Got everything. It. Okay. Uh, what kind well, of? Let's menu? say seven and a half percent. Let's try to be optimistic here. Seven and a half percent. And for and how many? Thirty years, I guess. Stretch it out as long as we can. Huh? All right, so the program's telling me I would have to spend $1,400 $1, a month to buy that house, right. but the rule told me I shouldn't spend more than eleven forty-five. dollars Correct. Problem. Now, first of all, one of the neat things about GoFigure is you can sort of red light that, right, and warn me of that difference? Absolutely. We're going to go grab a helper here, what we call a light object. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to condition it to tell us uh, when we're in or outside of our conditions. We're going to tell it we want to have a good condition when we're between thresholds, okay. we're under our budget. Now, what we're going to do is we'll start by taking our monthly payment. We'll connect it over here to the input so of that again, light. Again, you're linking cells here, basically. Mm -hmm. We'll take what we can budget, and we're going to connect it over here to our upper threshold. Mm -hmm. You can see the light tells us we're right, outside. Right. Okay, so red light, the number is too big. Now, how can I use GoFigure to make those numbers match by changing some of the variables inside? Well, you could certainly change any, but you can also work the problem backwards, what we call specifying an answer. Okay. Let's say we want an answer here. We want to be conservative and, and pay no more than $1,000 a month for that house. Okay. Now, GoFigure is asking, what do you want to vary? So, for example. Well, yeah, how much house can I afford then? What's the basic amount? Whoa, so the most I can afford is 161. 161. Suppose I can make a bigger down payment, what would it have to be? Well, let's ask. $79,000. No yeah. Good. Suppose I could get a better interest rate. Could well, I afford that? Let's find the interest rate. I'd have to get for forget it, huh? Forget it. All right, go figure. Tell me, go find another house. Right. Thanks a lot, Dick. My pleasure. Well, go figure is one unique way of representing information. Another way is to visually represent data so that you can better see significant relationships. That's the approach of our next program. It's called WinMap from Progis. All right, now let me ask you, we were just looking at, I guess, a kind of spreadsheet model, really, with GoFigure. This is really a database only allowing us to visually represent the information. Is that right? That's right. What we provide, Stuart, is a spatial engine for developers to build geo-multimedia applications. 
in other words, linking maps, databases, and multimedia into one application. So basically, I'm looking at a database, but you're giving me the ability to graphically query, basically, on, on criteria other than not some number equals something or some letter equals something, right? That's right, it's a visual representation. Okay, so let, let's continue with the housing example here. And before I was working on buying a house, we are looking at what, Whatcom County in the state of Washington right now? That's right. Let's say I'm looking for a house here because I heard Bill Gates moved here and I want to be close to him. <laughs> uh, he's a little bit near here. I want a house that has a water view because Gates has a water view, mm -hmm. right? And I travel a lot, so I want it to be within a couple of miles of the airport. How do I represent that query graphically to win that? Okay, so what I would do is I would take my mouse and point to the map area I'm interested in. So I'd zoom so in. So pick the closer. area with the bay view. That's right. And, I, and now I want to get near the airport. There's the airport, and I can go closer if I want to. Uh, there's the airport, and what I would do now is get a search tool, mm -hmm. but I can find things by radius, and I will hold it down and basically just draw a circle where I want this to be. And by drawing the circle, I am querying the database and saying, show me all houses for sale within that geographical area? That's correct, and it all will right. show you it found two houses here. All right, now how do I get the information? So I go and say to the system, give me more information on what I've just found. Queries the database. So that's one of the houses available. Yeah, and there's the other one. Okay. So let's say this is the one I'm interested in. I can now look at more information, like a picture of a house. So I started with a visual query, but that automatically links me not only to the data, but to graphics, to videos also, I take that's it? That's right, videos as well. So let's say I want a walkthrough of the house, for mm -hmm. example. I can go and run my video, and the video starts up and I'm running a video. All right, suppose I wanted to do this another way, and again, graphically look. Uh, somebody told me that the area of Bellingham is very nice, and there's some parks in there and so on, and my office is going to be in that area. I want to find a house that's uh, within walking distance of where I work. How would I use this then? Okay, first of all, what I would do is I'd go to the Bellingham area, and by clicking onto this. So we basically go to the, we focus the map on the Bellingham area, we center it, is that's that That's right. First of all, I select all the houses I want, uh -huh. then I focus on the Bellingham area, and this then focuses, this is the Bellingham area, and I can then go closer to the Bellingham area. And okay, now can I zoom in and say, here's where the office is, and let's say that red house is the office. This is the office. And then again, draw just a, a circle or a polygon around that. That's correct, and I'm going to go in within that radius from the office. Uh -huh. And can you zoom in even more so I can see details of the neighborhood on the map? Okay, I can go in closer. And there's no limit to how far I can go in. I can go right into the house uh -huh. as well and look at the street names, for example. Hmm, and I could see, actually, well, it's near the park. I could walk to the park. And again, this, what WinMap does is allows me to deal with a lot of information in a database, but in a visual, practical way as opposed to some sort of artificial query way. That's right. You can see what you're doing. Yeah. And that's why we coined the phrase software that shows. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. One of the problems in getting computers to understand the problems we need to solve is communicating our ideas to the computer. Well, at Stanford University, they are working on a revolutionary human computer interface that allows the computer to communicate directly with the human brain. So that we can Researchers at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, are probing the outer limits of the mind-computer interface. The Center for the Study of Language and Information, or CSLI, is host to a range of experimental studies which share a common name, the Archimedes Project. The goal is to use technology as leverage to give people with varied disabilities universal access to computers. From an engineering point of view, I could see answers to a lot of the problems that we've been working on to provide access for people with disabilities. And that the big problems lying ahead was how to actually make the connection to the brain. You know, it's connecting to the gray matter is probably bigger than a lot of the physical um, actual engineering problems which we can solve easily. One of the projects underway uses a head-mounted tracker as a kind of virtual mouse. J.B. Galan, another Stanford researcher, is so adept with the tracker that he often outpaces his mouse-bound colleagues at the same tasks. For persons unable to move even their heads, CSLI's eye tracker experiment uses a camera and an infrared beam to follow and interpret eye movement. A steady gaze in one target area is the same as clicking on a letter or icon with a mouse. The next interface challenge will be to interpret brain waves, a task that is not yet well understood you get a large amount of information 
and trying to figure out any one thing that means something specific is very difficult. And one of our researchers is actually looking at that now to see if we use a neural net and let it learn what the electrical signals are doing when you think yes or no or left or right, then that is going to allow us to make it practical much more quickly than you know, specifically trying to understand you know, what signal changes when you think yes. And is there another signal we can get when you say no? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. One of the terms used to describe the kind of software we're looking at today is computer-assisted thinking tools, or CAT software. Our next program is in this category, and it's called Project Kickstart. And Roy, this is your baby. You developed this program. How do I use Kickstart to help me think through a complex task? Like, I think the one we're going to talk about is, I decided my company should have its own website. I kind of don't know where to begin. How would I do it using Kickstart? Great. Well, what you do is you open the program, and you'll see it asks you a series of questions. These questions are keyed to the step of the process that you see at the left. So it will hold my hand through the thinking I have to do, essentially? Absolutely. And you typed in, you want to develop a home page. Right. Then you uh, go to the next step, and it will ask you, what are the major steps, or what are the major activities in building a home page? And how do page. I know the answer to that question? Well, often you'll know it from the problem. But if you have any problem, we have a library of phase names. Okay, and you so can it just... can prompt me to different phases I should be thinking about. Absolutely. These are put in by a project management consultant, so it's like having that consultant on board. Okay. Now, is that, what's that advisor button? Is that like a consultant who helps me think about these Absolutely. things? Absolutely. It's an advisor on tips for how to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, expertise of a project management right. advisor. So I determine the phases, and now what, I move down to goals next? Then you'll go down to goals. You'll figure out what the goals are, what tasks would accomplish the goals, and then where they go fit in the project. So let's stop for a second. So the goals here are increase sales, reduce customer support workload, improve customer interaction, improve corporate image, increase investor interest. I figured that out. Now how do I relate tasks to those goals? Well, it'll ask you one by one what tasks would accomplish them. Like how do you increase sales? Ah, provide information that's valuable have something that can be sold on the net. Okay, so it forces me to get specific. This is a goal, cool, but what are you going to do to accomplish that goal? Exactly, okay. and then they will move into your project. All right, so what is similar? Similar is similar projects. Now, um, we have some templates that come with the program, and you can see, for example, what can you learn from setting up a newsletter, and what you, maybe you have to design a logo, and that will go in your marketing phase. That's okay. done already. So I can learn from my experience if I set up a similar project before, right. kind of steal from that. And the program grows with you. OK, so next idea with the people that have to get involved in this? Yes, you identify people who are involved. And then the program asks you what tasks each person would do or suggest. Mm -hmm. What will the president do? What will the sales manager do, et cetera? And they flow into the program. The obstacle section is something a lot of the users like says, what are the obstacles to this, pro uh, to this uh, project? And again, there's an obstacles library, which lists 80 different obstacles that might be relevant. And you can drag and drop onto your so list. So I can scan your suggested obstacles and say, relevant to my case, not relevant to my case, et cetera. Yes, and add them to, so it grows with you. OK. And then assign is to relate the people to the tasks, isn't it? Exactly. It's where you assign uh, people to tasks. And uh, then you have the task list itself, which shows all of the tasks in a four-level outline, all the assignments, and you can add any notes. So this lets you um, notate what you're doing. So this really is computer-assisted thinking, as I talked about earlier. It's helping me think through a complex problem, organize it, outline it, relate people to tasks, et cetera. Exactly. And then you could dump this into Microsoft Project, right, and actually go ahead and manage the project. Yeah, and we have a link, and you just click on the icon, and uh -huh. all your data flows right into Microsoft Project. All right, Roy, thank you very much. OK, well, what we would really like a computer to do is make the tough decisions for us. If you could only accurately put a value on all the variables in a decision table, then a computer could make a decision. That is the approach of another new program we're going to look at called Decide Right. 
At the Intellimatch Corporation in San Jose, California, people are meeting and consulting all the time, whether it's informally in the hallway or at a desk, or organized around a conference table. As in all enterprises, making good decisions is the basis for good business. Intellimatch recently got some assistance in that task in a software package called DecideRight from Avantos. DecideRight organizes and displays the various elements of a decision and ranks them according to group consensus. It's a way to break down the complexity of the decision process and to keep the group on track. We are able to uh, get, go into much more detail using DecideRight than we would uh, uh, normally, just trying to make decisions in a, in a group setting. And that is because we can now track the different criteria and we can, it can, we can really see um, how the different options are weighted in each of the different uh, criteria groupings. Intellimatch is an internet-based recruitment service that matches employees with employers. The company's marketing department began using DecideRight to help them choose the best advertising venues. The key to decide right is a graphical drag and drop interface that groups items in categories by weighted importance. The program acts as a kind of coordinator, organizing the input for team members who can review the steps leading to their final consensus. It's a way to take some of the subjectivity out of the process. I, I don't think it can be removed, but, but yet I still think it's, it's somewhat important. It's, it's good to have, to be able to take advantage of people's instincts and, and their feel for a situation. And uh, what uh, DecideRight does is, because you can go uh, change the, the, the rankings of different options on the fly, you can meet in a, in a group type of setting and have people be interactive and, and discuss these ideas and reach agreement. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Finally, let's take a close look at another new program which helps you make good decisions. This one is called Which and Why. All right, Mark, let me go back to my housing analogy I used earlier in the program. Uh -huh. I used software, first of all, to figure out how much house I can afford. Then I used another program to tell me where I should actually buy the house. Let's say I've narrowed it down to a couple of houses now, and I have to make a decision which to make an offer on. How would I use which and why to make that decision? Well, before you can narrow it down to the, to the homes you want to buy, you need to define what your ideal home is. So what Witch and Why does is it helps you take those thoughts and ideas of your ideal home and prioritize those and come out with the ideal recommendation. So what do I really want is what I'm asking for. Exactly. Huh? You don't All even right. know what you want and so let's, let's show right, you so how, how do we do that? Is. So what you've done is you enter information from your head what's mm -hmm. important in a, in a home to you. Okay. Now you take all that information and you compare the relative importance of that. So in this case we'll look at uh, an area of the house, the main area of the house that has seven rooms and we're going to determine how important those rooms are to each other mm -hmm. in your own mind when you define your house. All right, so I'm saying, as I guess a lot of people would, that the kitchen is where we spend a lot of time. It's mm -hmm. really important to have a home in which we like the kitchen. Mm -hmm. and, this, and in, in this example, the kitchen happens to be rated the highest of 43.9% compared to the other rooms in, in the house. All right, and, I, and I, that happens because what, I move those sliders yeah, what you do is you click and drag the sliders. Now watch, if I, if I change this around, you can see the pie chart changes. Okay, so I'm I've saying there, said, I'm saying, well, the kitchen isn't quite as important Yeah, everything what I've just done is I said the den is a lot more important than the kitchen. Yeah. So I'll move it back uh, over here. So the first job, again, is to define what is the ideal house I'm really looking right. for and weight these various factors and the pieces of the house and so exactly. on. Exactly. All right, so that, now suppose I've already done that. Now how do I get to my problem of figuring out which house Okay, you end up with what we call a benchmark. Mm -hmm. And this is a benchmark of your ideal home. If you were able to graphically depict what your home would look like, this is what it looks like. So you've taken all those measurements, all those weightings, and turned them into mm -hmm. this sort of profile or graph of my ideal house. Exactly. And you can see the high points are the most important factors. If I point and click there, right. it shows that the kitchen is most important, and it shows the weight of the kitchen relative to the whole right. house. Now, how do I compare my ideal okay. to the houses I'm looking at? Okay, the next thing that you would do is you would score the houses that you're looking at. So I go to house A, go to house and a. you help me print out this little list over here, and mm -hmm. I say that was real good, that was not so good. Yeah, you Enter the data in the computer, mm -hmm. and? You grade it on a scale of 0 to 10, and you end up comparing those homes to your benchmark. See how well they scored. So okay. in this case, we've looked at four homes. Let's see how house C scored. 
And you can see from the graph that Not House so C great. didn't do so great because yeah. if you zoom in, you can see that it didn't even do well in my kitchen. Big or, gap between ideal and that house. Exactly. So okay. let's look at another one uh, that comes closer, and that's House A, or House B we'll use in this okay. case. That's now you can see match. that there's a very tight match with House B. Mm -hmm. uh, the graphs are very, very much alike. And this happens to be the house that Witch and Y recommends. So I could eyeball that graph and figure it out on my mm -hmm. own, or the software says, hey, this is the best match based on what you're yeah, looking Yeah, and it for. gives you an analysis over here. It says it takes a weighted average mm -hmm. and combines what we call a matching index, or the degree to which your, I, your option scores to your ideal benchmark, and comes out with a total Witch and Y score or an adjusted weighted average mm -hmm. score. And that's what Witch and Y recommends. Okay, so all I have to do is enter all the data and it'll do the comparisons and calculations and say, this is really the one you like. Exactly. All right, and thanks if you very much. Okay. All right, well, yeah. two software technologies that are often used in this area of computer-assisted thinking tools are artificial intelligence and neural networks. We asked our webmaster, Giles Bateman, to recommend some websites that would help us further explore this whole fascinating area of computer thinking. Thanks, Stuart. There are a lot of great artificial intelligence resources on the Internet. Let's start with Alaya Incorporated. These guys are software developers. Now, this is highly specialized software, so you'll really only be interested if you are part of an organization or institution that needs to do strategic thinking. But here we've got a list of their different components of their software. Here's Alaya Attract, what, and down here is Alaya Predict. What's interesting about this is these pieces of software use artificial intelligence to help an organization determine what characteristics make a market attractive and their relative importance and a lot of other bulleted points here. Now, next of all, if you're really interested in artificial intelligence for its own sake, you'll want to check out this page, Artificial Intelligence Resources on the Internet. Now, this has a collection of all sorts of great links to other artificial intelligence resources, everything from books, companies, and conferences, down to journals and news groups. The list goes on. Now, last but not least, let's have a look at neural networks. This is a particularly fascinating area of artificial intelligence that actually uses the computer to simulate the interaction of neurons, the way our own brains work. Here's a light introduction to uh, neural networks, give you an idea of how neurons interact. If you really don't care how neural networks work but are more interested in what they can do for you, click on the Manager's Guide to Neural Networks. This will give you a very nice description of the practical application for neural networks. Thanks, Giles. Time now for our weekly summary of the latest in the field of personal computing. Here's this week's computer news on Random Access. In the Random Access file this week, Oracle says its $500 system designed specifically for accessing the Internet is expected to go on sale in September. Called the Network Computer, or NC, it will be available in several configurations, including ones that use your existing television as a monitor, as well as ones that are similar to current laptop and desktop computers. AT&T announced plans to offer access to the Internet nationwide. WorldNet service will be offered either on an hourly or unlimited access basis. AT&T will offer existing long-distance customers a bonus. They'll get the service free for the first year if they use the network for five hours a month or less. Motorola is combining its cable modem technology with Sun Microsystems' Java programming language to bring high-speed Internet service to the home. Sun says this deal will give cable operators a boost toward delivering consumer-based broadband services. Apple Computer may begin turning away new subscribers to its troubled online service as early as this week. The San Jose Mercury News reports that the eWorld online system is tentatively set to shut down by April 1st. Apple is said to be pursuing agreements with other online services to turn over its 147,000 accounts. Will Compaq start a high-end PC price war? The Wall Street Journal says Compaq will cut prices by as much as 20 percent to build greater market share. Though good news to the corporate buyer, such a price war could knock smaller players such as Dell and AST out of the market. An $11 million federal suit has been brought against CompUSA by a St. Louis couple shocked to find child pornography on what they thought was their new laptop. The Associated Press says the suit seeks $10 million from the retailer for alleged consumer fraud over its practice of selling returned computers as new. The couple seeks another million dollars for emotional distress. And finally, another company may have gone too far to protect against obscenity. Surfwatch, a screening program designed to prevent children from seeing indecent text and pictures on the net, recently blocked access to the White House Worldwide website because it contained a dirty word, couples. 
In this case, the word referred to Bill and Hillary Clinton. Surf has fixed the problem. That's it for this week's computer news. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. When you use a computer for communicating, you want it to represent you, to be a personal form of expressing your ideas. Well, most people consider a computer-generated letter, for example, very impersonal. Well, I have found a software solution for that. You may have seen ads for this in some of the airline magazines. It's called Personal Font. And what this program does is turn your own handwriting into a selectable font style in your word processor. You fill in a sample writing sheet like this, and you fill in the blanks with examples of your handwriting. You send it into the company, and what they then do is send you a little floppy disk with your own personal font on it. In this case, it's mine called Stuart. And here's an example of using my handwriting. And you can see I'm writing in Microsoft Word here, but instead of using one of their fonts, I'm using my own handwriting. And it's just a regular font. You can go in here and underline, uh, go in here and change the font size, uh, do all the normal things you would do with a font. And when you're all done, you've got a neat looking letter that looks like you wrote it with a pen. All right, it is very cool. It lets you easily personalize any kind of correspondence. The company that makes personal font is called Signature Software, and they're based in Hood River, Oregon. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more on the latest in personal computers. I'm Stuart Chaffe. We'll see you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers. Developing PCs for business. Additional funding provided by the Software Publishers Association. Presenters of the Codies, the annual Excellence in Software Awards. Videotape copies of all Computer Chronicle shows are available for $32.50. Please order by show number and topic. And for more detailed information about the series, guests, and products featured, you can also order a subscription to the Chaffee Letter. In each issue, Stuart provides his unique insights and thoughts about the fast-changing world of personal technology. Videotapes and the Chaffee Letter can be ordered by calling 1-800-800-9520 or by writing us at the Computer Chronicles.